स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया In a course on real analysis, uh, you would have seen many instances where we had to extend our given function which is defined on an interval to a larger interval. So, a function f defined on i had to be extended to a function on j containing i. In fact, if we started off with a continuous function, we would have demanded many times to get hold of an extension which was also continuous. If we started off with a smooth function, the requirement was that we get a smooth extension to uh, j. So, the regularity had to be preserved. In this lecture, we will address a similar problem for holomorphic functions. Holomorphic functions as we have already seen by now is a very rigid class of functions. So, it is not very easy to answer the question of uh, extension. Many times there would not be uh, an extension possible at all. There are functions for example, defined on the unit disk which does not extend past the boundary at all. So, in this lecture we will prove a theorem called the Schwarz reflection principle which tells us certain special circumstances when we will be able to talk about the extension of a holomorphic function. So, let us try to set up the circumstances where we can indeed talk about such an extension. Let omega be an open connected set. And we will define omega bar to be the set of all those points z in the complex plane such that the conjugate of z belongs to omega. If we have a function f which is uh, holomorphic on omega, we can get a corresponding function defined on omega bar which is holomorphic as well. So, suppose f from omega into c be holomorphic. then um, f star may be from omega bar into c defined then define let us first define f from f star sorry from omega bar into c by f star of z to be equal to f of z bar the whole bar conjugate of f of the conjugate of z. So, good exercise for you to sit down and check that f star is holomorphic because f is f star is holomorphic on omega bar. Well, you could do it in any uh, of the favorite ways you deem fit. You could for example, sit down and check that the Cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied by f star or you could write down a power series expansion of uh, f and get hold of a power series expansion of f star and thereby proving that it is complex analytic and hence holomorphic. You can sit down and pick the uh, root to establish that f star is holomorphic. Now, if omega satisfies the oh, f star, it is not on omega, it is on omega bar by the way. f star is defined on omega bar as you can see here. Now, uh, we say that uh, domain is symmetric with respect to, to the real axis if omega is equal to omega bar. We say that omega is symmetric with respect to the real axis if omega is equal to omega bar. Remember that we are still in the situation where omega is an open connected set and the connectedness will tell you another exercise for you is to check that omega intersects the real line. What you could do is that pick a point z in the upper half plane z bar is also in the uh, domain omega and because it is connected there is a path and use the intermediate value theorem to conclude that the path should necessarily intersect the real axis. Okay. 
Now suppose we will in this lecture we will only be interested in such journals. So, in this so we shall now focus on symmetric domains or domains symmetric with respect to the real axis domains omega maybe open connected sets. omega which are symmetric with respect to the real axis. Now, in this scenario let us define a function g define g from omega to c given by g of z to be equal to f of z minus f star of z. So, let me just write it as f z bar the whole bar that is f star of z right. So, uh, f star is defined on omega bar which is omega here. So, this makes completely uh, perfect sense and the fact that g is uh, 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 a difference of holomorphic function tells us that g is holomorphic on omega. Now, suppose f satisfies the condition that f of x is a real number whenever x is a real number. Then let us see what happens to uh, g on the points where omega intersects real, the real axis. Then for x in omega intersected with r f of x bar the whole bar is equal to f of x and this tells us that g of x is equal to 0. But then if x is in omega intersected with r omega being an open set we will have an entire interval which is contained in omega now, since omega is open there x is a comma b in r such that a less than x less than b such that a b contained in r is contained in, is in fact contained in omega let me not complicate to it too much just say that the interval a b which is sitting inside the real line is contained in omega and f of x is sorry g of x is equal to 0 on a b. But then now let us go back to uh, the uh, uh, previous weeks lectures and recall that uh, the zeros of a holomorphic function are isolated if it is not 0. So, in particular if uh, g of x is equal to 0 if g, if g were to be uh, non 0 and if g of x were to be 0 then there exists a punctured neighborhood of x where g does not vanish but that can never happen here and uh, the identity theorem which it was called as hence tells us that g is identically equal to 0 by identity theorem. Where? On omega that is the rigidity of the holomorphic functions that uh, we have is not it and this tells us that f of z is equal to f of z bar the whole bar on omega. So, if uh, omega were to be a symmetric domain and uh, uh, f is a function which uh, satisfies the condition that it preserves the real line then f satisfies this condition by the identity theorem. We will use this very crucially to talk about uh, an extension theorem now which will be proved as the Schwarz reflection principle. Before we state uh, the Schwarz re reflection principle given a symmetric domain uh, let us give some fix some notations let omega uh, be an open connected set. Uh, which is symmetric with respect to the real line. Then 
set omega plus to be all those points in omega which are in the upper half plane the imaginary part of z is greater than 0. Let omega minus be the set of all those points in omega whose imaginary part is less than 0. And let us denote by i the set of all those points in omega which are on the real line imaginary part of z is equal to 0. So, then hence we have omega is the union of omega plus i and omega minus. So, this is the notations that we will be using. Now, let me state down the Schwarz reflection principle. This theorem is called the Schwarz reflection principle. Uh, let omega be as above. Suppose we have a function f, suppose f is a function which is defined on omega plus union i complex valued function which is continuous on omega plus union i and analytic or holomorphic on omega plus. Suppose we have a function like this. Suppose f of x is real valued for all x in i, then there exists a function g defined on omega holomorphic on omega such that g of z is equal to f of z for z in omega plus union i. So, in other words it can be extended to omega minus. Let us just draw a picture no pictures were drawn yet. So, suppose this is our uh, real line which I am now drawing in say orange and uh, our domain is say something like this, something like this or oh, then uh, symmetric domain it will be something like this. So, omega plus will turn out to be the uh, region I am shading in red in the upper half plane and uh, the violet is the uh, region omega minus. And uh, our theorem tells us that, so if the light green part is i, the theorem tells us that if there is a function which is holomorphic on red and which extends to the uh, region in green, then we will be able to extend it to the entire omega. So, this is a very powerful extension theorem in the setting of complex analysis. Let us give a proof of this statement. We have already given a candidate to ourselves when uh, f is equal to a real number on i, then we know that f of z is the same as f of z bar the whole bar if it is defined on the uh, symmetric domain entirely. So, we will just as well define g of z to be equal to f of z bar the whole bar on omega minus and g of z to be equal to f of z on omega plus union i. So, if you notice we have uh, just defined g to be equal to f on omega plus union i. So, in particular g is going to uh, match with f on omega plus union i. We just need to ensure that this function g is holomorphic. If we are able to do that, then uh, we have a holomorphic extension of f to omega. Let us get to proving that. The first observation here is that uh, this is an exercise again for you by the pasting lemma if you want. g is a continuous function. Crucial fact that will be used is that f of z bar the whole bar is equal to f of z on r in order to establish this exercise. g is a continuous function on omega and uh, enough to show that g is holomorphic. So, to prove that g is holomorphic we shall now prove that g is holomorphic on omega. If we carefully look at how we have defined g, uh, check that f is already holomorphic on 
omega plus and hence G is holomorphic on omega plus and F Z bar the whole bar is holomorphic on omega minus so this is holomorphic on omega minus as well. So we have reduced the problem to checking for whether the function f is complex differentiable at the points on i. Enough to now check. Complex differentiability or rather holomorphicity on i. Complex differentiability at points on i. Being a local property, what we will do is we will show that given a point on i, let z0 be some point on i, let us prove that f g is holomorphic in a neighborhood of z0. So, in order to do that, uh, let r be such that d z0 r bar is contained in omega. Suppose we pick an r like this. We will show that G is holomorphic on dz0 r and we will prove that it is uh, holomorphic by the Morera's theorem. We by Morera's theorem it is enough to check. So, this is an exercise for you. I will tell you why this is, a, is, this is an exercise. It is enough to check that integral of f over or rather g over t is equal to 0 for every triangle t in d z 0 r. If you go back to Morera's theorem statement, we actually prove that if integral of g over any closed polygonal path is 0, then our function g is uh, holomorphic. I am actually writing a more special statement here. I am demanding that we only need to check that integral of g over t is 0 for every triangular path. So, you should sit down and convince yourself that if we prove this, we are in fact proving that overall closed polygonal paths the integral is 0 and therefore we will be able to conclude by Morera's theorem that our function g is holomorphic. Okay, so let us now draw a picture to capture what we are uh, trying to prove. Suppose we are in this point z0 and suppose we have the disc of radius r around. Yeah, maybe I should start off with the and suppose this is the point z0. So, z, d z0 r is being captured here. And suppose we have a triangle, suppose the triangle is like this. The first thing to note would be that we can split the triangle into two polygons, one which is being captured in red and the other which is being captured in green. And how will the arrows be? The arrows will be like this of the straight lines where the orientation is being considered and here it will be in this direction. And I am saying orientation, I just mean the initial and the uh, terminal point of uh, the lines that we are considering. So, if you notice the green and the red will cancel off each other and uh, further we can split the quadrilateral below into maybe the dark green one or uh, some other color maybe purple, purple is good. So, it can be split here and further it will be in this manner and the red will go in this manner now. So, the triangles will all cancel off each other and what we can conclude by this. So, this picture is representative of uh, one particular type of triangle. There are many cases that might come up. Let me just write down what we, uh, we would like to do enough to show that integral of g over t is equal to 0 for t contained in either omega plus union i or omega minus union i or t contained in omega minus union i. 
if we show it for these cases by considering the uh, various cases that come up and the image tells us that the integral of f over every triangle is going to be 0. So, this is uh, enough for us to establish our result. Let us now draw a new picture in that case. So, we have now this disk of radius r around z naught and uh, now two possibilities can happen either the triangle just touches uh, at a vertex the uh, part i or it could be a triangle of this type with a edge on uh, the real axis. The more there are two cases the more difficult one is when the edge is on the real axis. We will prove that integral of f over such a triangle is 0 and I will leave the case when a vertex just a vertex is on the real axis is there as an exercise for you. So, we shall now prove that integral of f over t is equal to 0 when t is a, a triangular path. So, let me now give some names to it. This is z1, z2, z3. So, when t is the triangular path gamma z1 to z2 to z3 to z1 where z2 and z3 are on i. So, this is the case we will be trying to prove right now. This is the most difficult case. Once we establish this, then we are uh, in good shape to conclude our result. So, the first observation is the following. If you notice the convex hull T hat which is basically summation a i z i where summation a i is less than or equal to 1. This is a compact set and g being continuous g is hence uniformly continuous on t hat. So, before we use uniform continuity let us pick some notations let capital M be the supremum of absolute value of g of z when z is in t hat. Remember that t hat is compact and hence this is going to be a finite number. Let us call that number as m and let d be equal to the supremum of g of z minus g of w where z and w belongs to t. This is the diameter of our uh, triangle t. So, let us set these notations and by uniform continuity uh, by uniform continuity given an epsilon positive we have a delta given any epsilon positive where x is a delta greater than 0 which is however less than epsilon we can always do that delta less than epsilon greater than 0 such that the difference g of z minus g of w is less than epsilon whenever z minus w is less than delta. This is something on t hat. This is something which we can ensure. Now, let us go back to our picture here and let us pick two points. Let us pick uh, two points in dark green. Let us call the points w3 and w2 here and connect these two points. Then if we are to write down the integral pick how, how are these w2s and w3s picked w2 and w3 on gamma uh, z1 to z2 yes z1 to z2 and gamma z1 to z3 respectively such that the difference of absolute value of the difference of w2 and z2 is less than delta w2 is at a distance less than delta from z2 and similarly w3 is at a distance less than delta from z3 this is something which we have already picked okay and 
then the integral of f over t this is going to be equal to the integral of where is the picture the picture is this this is the uh, triangle z1 z2 z3 is the triangle by breaking it up we can go along this triangle and then along this particular quadrilateral the line green line the integrals cancel off and we will be able to get back the integral over the triangle itself so uh, writing it down we have integral of f over t is the uh, integral of f over the following parts z1 w2 w3 z1 this triangle plus where is an f of z dz here the integral over gamma w3 to w2 to z2 to z3 to w3 the polygonal path of f of z dz now if you notice dz0 r intersected with the upper half plane that is an open set and in that open set this triangle is contractible it is null homotopic and therefore by Cauchy's theorem this is equal to 0 by Cauchy's theorem. So, what remains is the integral over the polygon uh, gamma w3 to w2 to w to z2 to z3 to w1. Let us now try to see what that particular integral is. That is exactly equal to the integral of f over gamma, right? So, integral of uh, gamma w3 to w2 to z2 to z3 to w3. This is the, uh, let me just draw it. This is the polygon we are interested in. We have a z2 here, there is a z3, there is a w3 here, there is a w2 here, right? So, w3 to w2 to z2 to z3 to w3 of f of z dz and this is just the uh, sum of the integral over the various straight lines. This is from z2 to z3 plus integral from z3 to w3 from w3 to w2 and finally, the integral from w2 to z2. This is precisely what this integral is going to be. We will focus on the first one and the third one together and uh, get some estimates. If you look at f of z dz gamma z2 to z3 plus the integral of f w3 to w2, this is the same as the reversal, the second one is the in minus of the reversal, right? So, this is going to be, let me write down the equation or maybe I should not jump that step, let me write it down, z2 to z3 minus integral w2 to w3 of f of z dz. You could use any uh, parameterization of this straight line. Uh, to compute this integral, we will use the standard uh, parameterization. So, what is gamma uh, z2 to z3 of t going to be? The initial point is going to be z2 and the terminal point is going to be equal to z3. And similarly, gamma w2 to w3 is equal to 1 minus t times w2 plus t times w3. We will do the explicit computations. We are only using the uh, definition of the integral of a continuous function on a curve to write whatever we are writing just now. This is going to be f of 1 minus t times z2 plus t times z3. This is a straight line path. Remember, it is a straight line path and hence it is going to be smooth and gamma prime t is just going to be equal to z3 minus z2, which is not dependent on t from 0 to 1. Similarly, the second one is integral f of 
1 minus t times w2 plus t times w3 and um, w3 minus w2. So this is precisely the, uh, the sum of these two integrals. This integral is what I have just written down. So if you look at uh, the absolute value here, okay, let me not uh, confuse things. Let me just look at what the absolute value of gamma z2 to z3 of f of z dz minus integral gamma w2 to w3 f of z dz. This is what this is basically plus integral gamma w3 to w2 f of z dz which I am just writing it this way. This is equal to the uh, absolute value. I will just skip a step write z3 minus z2 times the integral of f of 1 minus t times z2 plus t times z3 minus f of 1 minus t times w2 plus t times w3 dt and then I will just add and subtract uh, z3 minus z2 times that and hence we will be getting w3 minus w2 minus z3 minus z2 this absolute value times the integral f of 1 minus t times w2 plus t times w3 dt. This is precisely what we will be able to write in this integral as. Now we are in good shape because if you look at 1 minus t times uh, z2 plus t times z3 minus 1 minus t times w2 plus uh, t times w3, this is less than delta. Therefore, this quantity in the brackets that is going to have absolute value less than epsilon. So, we will be able to write this as hence this is less than or equal to mod of z3 minus z2 times epsilon times 1 minus 0 which is 1. And the second one will be uh, the absolute value of w3 minus z3 uh, plus absolute value of w2 minus z2 times the integral of uh, f of 1 minus t times w2 plus t times w3 which has absolute value less than or equal to m on t bar. In particular, this is going to be less than z3 minus z2 is bounded by the, the uh, diameter of t which was captured to be d times epsilon and w3 minus z3 was less than delta which in particular is less than epsilon. So, this is less than 2 epsilon m and hence this is less than or equal to d plus 2 m times epsilon. Let us now focus on what happens on the other two sides. Integral of f on what are the other two sides? z3 to w3 and w2 to z2. I will just show you what happens on uh, z3 to uh, w3 of f of z dz. Absolute value of this, this is going to be equal to a um, very similar uh, argument as earlier. So, curve starting at z3 plus t times w3 dt and gamma prime t is just going to be equal to uh, w3 minus z3 absolute value of this and that is going to be less than or equal to w3 minus z3 is bounded by delta which is in fact less than epsilon and the thing inside the uh, integral will be bounded by m and therefore the entire uh, integral of f over t this is less than or equal to some constant times epsilon. Similarly, you can talk about the other fourth uh, side of the parallelogram as well, uh, quadrilateral as well and uh, we will be able to conclude that this is less than epsilon for every epsilon and hence integral of f over t is equal to 0. So, essentially what we have concluded is that oh, I have started writing f at some point of time even though I was writing g, I do not know when it started becoming f. 
Okay. So from here, uh, whatever is written here as f is actually g. So let me just do that small work. So this is g. I hope that this has not confused you because uh, our attempt was to show that g is a holomorphic function. So uh, the Morera's theorem was being attempted uh, for the function g and not on f. It was a silly mistake to have written f here. But I hope it has not confused the proceedings of this proof. And this tells us that uh, G by Morera's theorem is holomorphic in D Z0 R. But our choice of Z0 on the on the uh, in, in on the set I was arbitrary, and which tells us that G is hence holomorphic on omega. Therefore, we have a holomorphic extension of f to the entire set omega. So this result is classically known as the Cauchy reflection principle which has really far reaching uh, implications in number theory and many other fields.